This episode is brought to you by Tegas, the modern research platform for leading investors. Tired of running your own expert calls to get up to speed on a company? Tegas lets you ramp faster and find answers to critical questions more efficiently than any alternative method. The gold standard for research, the Tegas platform delivers unmatched access to timely, qualitative insights through the largest and most differentiated expert call transcript database. With over 60,000 transcripts spanning 22,000 public and private companies, investors can accelerate their fundamental research process by discovering highly differentiated and reliable insights that can't be found anywhere else in the market. As a listener, drive your next investment thesis forward with Tegas for free at tegas.co slash Patrick. This is Business Breakdowns. Business Breakdowns is a series of conversations with investors and operators diving deep into a single business. For each business, we explore its history, its business model, its competitive advantages, and what makes it tick. We believe every business has lessons and secrets that investors and operators can learn from, and we are here to bring them to you. To find more episodes of Breakdowns, check out joincolossus.com. All opinions expressed by hosts and podcast guests are solely their own opinions. Hosts, podcast guests, their employers or affiliates may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. This is Matt Russell, and today we are breaking down Live Oak Bank. Our guest today is Stephen Bafier, the founder of Story Labs Capital Partners. And I had asked Stephen several times over the years if he'd be interested in joining me for a breakdown. When he finally said he had an interesting name, I'll admit, I was slightly disappointed that he came back with a bank. Then he started to share the details about Live Oak Bank. Live Oak is a bank that received its charter right before the financial crisis. It does not have the 100-year-plus histories of many of the banks that we know so well today, the JP Morgans, the Goldman Sachs, and the other too-big-to-fail banks. This is a new story, and it's a new story with very interesting DNA in terms of how they built up this bank. They targeted specific industries. They targeted the SBA loan program, and they had technology in their DNA. So they've done some unique things to build assets on the balance sheet, to build equity in this bank, and to really build a name within a sector that is incredibly difficult to break into. I really think this is an interesting case study in how you can think about old dated industries, which seemingly have massive barriers to entry, but there are often ways that you can approach these from unique angles. Chip Mahan, founder of Live Oak, certainly found that here. Please enjoy this breakdown of Live Oak Bank. All right, Stephen, I thought the best place to start was actually at the beginning, which was not very long ago. And that's unique for a bank. It was founded in 2007. And today it's north of 10 billion in assets, a billion in equity value. So they've clearly accomplished something in terms of putting their stamp in the industry. What was the unique market opportunity that the founders saw in founding this business? And we could just kick off there and roll on Live Oak from there. To me, Live Oak is one of the best business stories of the past 15 years that nobody's heard of. What did the founders see? Well, I think they saw a community banking industry that has aged into a lousy business. And it's just a fundamentally flawed model. And so let me get this straight. It's capital intensive, it's low margin, and it's highly levered. So if I lend you money and all goes well, I get back principal and interest. Yet on the flip side, because of the leverage a measly 8% drawdown in assets can wipe out my entire equity stack. And oh, by the way, you have a mountain of technical debt and this physical branch fixed cost infrastructure that's of no use to the marginal customer. And so it's not shocking to me that net promoter scores are abysmal. And this is an industry for disruption. And you see that manifesting in the consolidation in the space. And so when I was born in 1984, you had close to 15,000 banks in the US, today, 4,000. Physical branches have been declining over the past 15 years. And then if you look at the 20 trillion plus of assets in the US banking system, the top 50 banks have something like 75 or 80% share. All of those banks are 40 billion plus institutions. Do you think they care about the small business down the street doing a million and a half of revenue? I don't think so. And so to me, it, it reminds me of the Keith Raboy tweet a few years ago that I love. It's the secret to startup success 
is to find a highly fragmented industry with low MPS and then vertically integrate a solution to radically improve the customer experience. And that's what Live Oak has done here. And so they started in 2007, as you said, with a blank sheet of paper, no sunk costs, and a simple business plan to really become America's small business bank. Yeah. And let's get into that business plan, because I think you mentioned a lot of the issues that exist with the system of community banks, low margin. How do you actually make it into a better business, higher quality profile, whatever it may be? What was different about their approach? Yeah, there are a couple pillars of the business plan. I think number one, let's focus on this profitable niche called the SBA 7A loan, and we can get into the dynamics there. The second pillar was let's rethink this entire system. I mean, if you think about most community banks, you're focused on one geographic region around your physical branch, and you have to be all things to all people in that region. Well, let's clean the slate. And if we don't have branches and we can operate it on a national scale, why don't we take this novel approach to lending and only focus on the industries that tend to pay their loans back? And so that's called the theory of verticality. And then the third pillar was, let's get back to basics. I mean, banking is a fundamentally customer service business, and that's been lost. As the competitive battleground has shifted from the physical branches where Wendy at the counter into an icon on your phone, how do you execute on an exceptional customer service experience that's both high touch and high tech? And so those are the three pillars, and we can dive into each as you see fit. Yeah, great. Shout out there. I actually do have a Wendy at my local bank. She helps with <laughs> notarizing documents. So there is an element there. But I think you mentioned a lot in terms of the cost profile. One of the bigger things with a bank is you do need to attract assets. You need to attract business. And I want to start on the first point you made on the SBA loans. Everyone became familiar with the SBA program after the PPP loans during COVID. But prior to that, the SBA has been making loans and have had this program for an extended period of time. So maybe just tap into that, because I think just in the basic research that I did, this was a major piece of what they were doing. Talk a little bit about the program and how Live Oak approached it. Yeah, so the SBA dates back to the early 50s under the Eisenhower administration. It was really started to help provide financial support to small businesses. And so the 7A program is their flagship loan and it's a great option if you're a small business and you meet the eligibility requirements. And then to incentivize lenders to actually lend to these small businesses, typically without too much credit history, the government will guarantee 75% of the loan you originate. And so the founder, Chip Mahan, he has said that a well-priced 7A loan is the best piece of paper a bank can originate. And so that's really how they got started, how they scaled. And so we can walk through some of the unit economics. If you're a veterinarian and you have that entrepreneurial itch to go across the street and start your own practice, and you need a million bucks to build out your facility, well, Live Oak will underwrite a 7A loan for a million dollars, and the government will guarantee 750000 of that. And so there's a liquid secondary market for that guaranteed piece of paper. And so Live Oak can turn around and sell that $750,000 guaranteed portion at a 10% gain on sale and instantly put $75,000 in their pocket. Oh, and by the way, they get to keep the 1% servicing fee to accrue $7,500 of annual non-interest income for the life of the loan. So now you're left with $250,000 of unguaranteed paper. Well, the SBA lets you sell down to 10%. This is still a loan to a veterinarian with a 750 plus credit score, a personal guarantee. So a third party is willing to take $150,000 of that loan at par. So now you're left with $100,000 of exposure backed by $10,000 of equity, earning a few thousand dollars of net interest income. And so if you add all that up, year one revenue is over $85,000 at extremely high incremental margins before the corporate overhead of the bank, obviously, but they were able to generate 35% plus returns on equity on that $10,000 stub, despite being subscale in the early days. And so it was just rinse and repeat, originate and sell, originate and sell. And they were one of the few banks that were actually able to get to scale, $11 billion of assets, as you alluded to, in a wildly capital efficient manner. Maybe we could talk a little bit about the gain on sale part of the unit economics, just to step back and make sure that everyone understands that piece. Talk a little bit about 
the rates that they're lending at, and then where that paper trades in the market, just to bring home the point of how that's booked and what the dynamic is there that allows them to essentially have some type of arbitrage in the market to immediately realize that gain. Yeah, most of these loans will be variable rate in nature. And so I think prime plus 200 basis points, but you have the government guarantee. And so, of course, that's going to trade at par. You have this floating rate government guaranteed piece of paper and the spreads will fluctuate over time. I mean, they've bounced around that 10% gain on sale level. Interestingly, as rates rise, the borrowers are more incentivized to pay the loan back quicker. And so spreads may compress a little bit. And that's what we've seen recently. But over time, I think that 10% level has been pretty consistent. Yeah. So if I just try to simplify it, I'm making this loan to the veterinarian. And let's say it's a 5% just for the sake of using numbers. But given three quarters of that loan is actually guaranteed by the government, that stub of that piece of paper should actually trade at a lower yield, given it is fully guaranteed versus the whole paper. Therefore, some buyer would be willing to pay or get a yield that's sub 5%, maybe 4%. And that's what's driving that gain. Is that a reasonable way to simplify what's going on there? Exactly. If the guaranteed portion is 100 yielding, let's say 9% today, a buyer may be willing to buy it for 110. And therefore, the implicit yield will be something below 9%. And then the next natural question is, Live Oak clearly had this opportunity to do this. Why weren't other banks doing this? Or were there other banks doing this? How much competition existed in the space? And what allowed them to succeed where you don't hear as many other names having success with this program and this type of strategy? So if you think about the standard community bank, and we talked about this, it's one geographic region around a physical bank. You just can't issue 7A loans exclusively and have any semblance of scale. And so it was one piece for community banks, but it just wasn't a large component of their business. So you had to do it at a national scale. And then, so what about the big banks? And they were doing some of it. I mean, Wells Fargo was at the top of the league tables before Live Oak came around. JP Morgan was a big player as well. But these are multi-trillion dollar institutions. So to originate a billion or two of SBA loans at high margins... It just doesn't move the needle. It would be like if Berkshire Hathaway bought a 1% stake in Live Oak. Sure, it may be a great investment, but it's just so far below their threshold that it won't make sense. Yeah, that adds up. And with these type of government programs, there's a lot of paperwork. There's a lot of working with the government who isn't the easiest partner in terms of doing things efficiently. How were they able to get around that? Was there any type of pre-existing relationship or is there any type of unique dynamic which actually allowed them to scale when you don't have that same physical footprint still being able to attract those type of loans? How did they go out and actually bring in the business, even if you see the market opportunity to actually get the customers to work with you is a different piece of the story. So what was their approach there? There's two components there. And it's the second two of the three pieces of the business plan. So one, we could start with the theory of verticality. As I said, instead of focusing on a geographic region, let's focus on industries that tend to pay their loans back. Out of the gates, they were actually getting this data by pulling Freedom of Information Act requests to get historical payback data by industry for SBA loans. And what they found was that veterinarians were at the top of the list in terms of credit quality. And so let's just start there and let's become experts and domain experts in the vet vertical. And so let's hire a veterinarian full-time on staff. Let's go to all the trade shows. Let's present at all the veterinarian colleges nearby or across the US and abroad. Let's build a brand within that community. You get to know the thought leaders and the evangelists, and then you start by spreading by word of mouth. And then you can also do unique things where in addition to offering them capital, you're offering them expertise. And so you're helping them build the website. As they're building out their facility, you're pointing out all the common pitfalls that other folks have run into. So that's how they built a brand with specific businesses. The second aspect of the question was working with the government and the paperwork. I mean, these are pretty complex loans. And that is where the technology piece comes in. Out of the gates, they realized if they wanted to execute on customer service and adhere to their core value of 
treating every customer like the only customer in the bank, they had to have a seamless handoff of customer data between the lending officer, the underwriter, the servicer, and the closer. They started writing code in 2010, 2011 to build software that would allow them to do that. I mean, there are 148 documents required to underwrite an SBA loan. They didn't want customers having to fill out all of this information multiple times. And so they actually wrote code for themselves as the first customer and then took a page out of the Amazon playbook and turned this large R&D expense into a revenue driver by productizing that software. They brought in a gentleman named Pierre Naudet to run this subsidiary called Encino. Before the IPO, they spun that out. Encino is now a publicly traded company, 3 billion plus valuation. So by building their own software, they not only scratched their own itch, but they created massive amounts of value for the original Live Oak investors. It's a good opportunity to transition just a bit to the people because I think everyone has this insight of if we can take something that we're doing internally and productize that and turn it into a revenue generator, that is amazing business. Many people make the observation, very few people actually execute on that successfully. And I don't know too many examples where that's happening within a banking organization, which again, the DNA of banks does not tend to be the most innovative human beings. And that's part of the nature of the business. So you referenced Chip Mahan. Let's go a bit into his story and what he was doing prior to Live Oak and just a little bit more about him, because all this is very interesting in terms of the observation and how they've executed on it. Yeah, Chip Mahan, he is special. Honestly, I think in a few years, David Senra is going to be doing podcasts on him. But if we go back to his youth, unfortunately, he had a family tragedy really shape his childhood. The family was living in Buffalo, New York. His dad was working for an oil company. And on September 4th, 1962, he was 11 years old. And it was the first day of sixth grade. His mom wakes him up and tells him, unfortunately, his father had been killed in a company plane crash. So... This is someone who had to grow up pretty quickly. And then in the aftermath, he and the family moved back to Kentucky to live on his grandfather's farm. The first Sunday there in town, he goes to church and he meets a girl named Peggy. A few years later, when they're 14, he writes in Peggy's yearbook that he's going to marry her. And then when they're 22, two weeks after college graduation, he achieves that goal. And here we are 50 plus years later, and they're happily married. And so this is someone who has been bending the universe towards his will from a very young age. And if we think about his career progression, he graduates from Washington and Lee, he gets married, and then he joins Wachovia Bank and Trust Company in 1973. And so this is where he learns the business of banking. He's going up and down Kentucky and Tennessee, lending money primarily to distilleries, and learning how to lend money, learning that this is a deeply service-based business. And he's growing with the bank. And then he gets to his late 20s and he realizes that you're either an employee or you're an owner. And he just had this entrepreneurial itch that he couldn't put back in the bottle. He originally toyed with the idea of buying an equipment rental franchise and that fell through. And then he saw an opportunity to do a hostile takeover of his hometown community bank in Kentucky. And so the bank was trading at 25% of book value. And he sees this opportunity where you can pay shareholders three times what the stock is trading at and still get the bank for less than free. He quits his job at Wachovia. He sets up shop in Kentucky and starts dialing for dollars. And he doesn't get one single share. That was his first realization that so many of us have that businesses just can't be contained in a spreadsheet. And it's ultimately about people and relationships. But he parlayed that quote unquote failure into capital relationships. And then he just started buying and selling other banks in Kentucky throughout the 80s and early 90s. And so it was a great strategy. He would take rural banks with sticky deposits and slap them together with banks making loans in larger cities like Lexington and Louisville. And so he's optimizing both sides of the balance sheet increasing net interest margins. And this ultimately culminated in Cardinal Bank shares going public in 1992, made a ton of money for himself and investors. And so then a few years later, he's sitting at dinner with his brother-in-law, who was a technologist. And the brother-in-law is telling him about this thing called the internet. And so they have this crazy idea to put the first bank on the internet. They started it in 1994. It launches in 1995. And obviously, this is 10 or 15 years ahead of its time. And so they had a hard time attracting customers. And so 
they offload the banking part of that business to Royal Bank of Canada, but they spin off the technology piece. And so now they're in the software business, selling software to the big banks to help them put products on the internet. And this became an internet darling, as you would expect. And right in the height of the mania, Chip had the foresight to raise a bunch of capital from his customers, and that allowed them to survive through the crash. And the business ultimately had an M&A exit a few years later. But that's his story. And it's this combination of deep domain expertise in banking mixed with just this phenomenal capital allocation track record where he used every tool in the playbook, whether it was IPOs or spinoffs or equity raises, M&A. So that's, I think, the unique combination he provides. Yeah, he clearly has an incredible background, both in terms of the industry expertise. And as you were following that story, I was waiting for the technology piece to come in, obviously arriving with his brother-in-law, the internet, and then starting to work on software. When starting Live Oak, what was the technology piece that he was able to culminate just in terms of attracting talent to be able to build that type of software and then continuing to lean on what seems like a physical light approach, not as capital intensive when it comes to physical locations, depending on technology for a lot of the business. How have they been able to succeed with that? Obviously, it's a bit in his DNA now after 20 years and some early internet experience. But is there anything else that gets into the secret sauce whether it's people or other approaches that they've taken to be able to succeed with that technology first approach? Yeah, I think there's a couple of components. Number one, as I said, they're scratching their own itch and they weren't just successful with Encino. That's probably the most notable example, but they did this again with Aperture, again with Fins Act. And so they've done it over and over again with an incredibly high hit rate. So part of it is they're a regulated banking entity and they're creating products for themselves to use as customer number one. But the second piece of productizing it and turning this expense into a revenue driver and really creating enormous value comes down to the fact that, as you said, I mean, Chip Mahan, he has been a collector of people his entire career. And if you look at his orbit, it all stems back to S1, which was the software that he spun out of the bank. Neil Underwood, who has been his really the architect of technology innovation at Live Oak, he was at S1. And then Pierre Naudet, the CEO they brought in to run Encino, S1. Chris Babcock, the CEO of Aperture today, S1. And then Finzact, which we can get into some of these and what they do. But Frank and Mike Sanchez, who are running that, they built a core banking processor in the 90s and then ultimately sold it to FIS, I think in 2004. And so they have experience building a core relatively recently. And so Chip tapped into them and their expertise to build Finzact and Live Oak was the seed investor there. And so I think it's a combination of scratching your own itch, having access to talented folks who have done this before and then the third piece is just culture. I mean, most banks, one, they're not technology organizations, but two, they don't have the culture to really paint this wildly ambitious target and go find the people to run and make it successful. One of the things that's also interesting here is you do have what might be considered technology first banking organizations, but most of them are neo banks. They don't actually have banking charters, they depend on others with banking charters. And that gets a little bit complicated as it relates to margins and then just the stability of the overall organization. So can you talk a little bit about that piece as well? Like what the banking charter represents? And when you think about housing all of this under the same umbrella, I think about my bank is really focused on credit quality and ensuring that deposits are safe. At the same time, it's very interesting to think about those high upside opportunities that they're incubating or investing behind. So how does that all come together? And what role does the charter play in all of this, the banking charter, if any? It's interesting. When you refer to neobanks, a neobank just means you're operating without branches and you're operating exclusively online. And so technically, Live Oak is a neobank. However, as you state, I mean, when most people think of it, they're thinking of a fintech that is operating outside of the regulatory requirements. And that's been the ethos of Silicon Valley, avoid regulation at all costs. Whereas Live Oak, they really leaned into the regulation and they're a full vertically integrated platform, which is very different. I mean, if you think about what most banks are, and you talked about this, but it's regulatory compliance, it's risk management and customer service. 
The technology piece is completely outsourced. And so they're relying on the major core providers. So Fiserv, FIS, and Jack Henry have dominant market share there. But those are the folks that are the system of record. And then they're offering ancillary technology on top of that as well. This is all legacy technology. I mean, banking tech is stuck in the 90s. It would be like if NetSuite never came along and your ERP system was still stuck on premise. The example I like to use here is when Live Oak wanted to use Aperture for online account opening, they wanted to loop Aperture into their core, which was Fiserv Premier at the time. And they were able to build it, but it took 18 months and 62 API calls to do it. And so it was still clunky at the end of it after all that time and effort and expense. Chip Mahan likes to say that 280 billion lines of code in banking that all needs to get rewritten on a modern cloud-based architecture over the next five or 10 years. Like that's the vision. They want to create an open next-gen core provider called Finzact, which is partner-friendly. And that is the core system of record. But then uh, point solutions like Aperture for account opening or like PayRails for bill pay can link into it with just one API or one line of code. That's the challenge. I think actually the person that describes this the best is William Hockey, who was one of the co-founders of Plaid. William, he left Plaid in 2019 to quietly start another fintech company in stealth mode. And then he did something really interesting in 2021. He bought a single branch bank in Chico, California for $50 million. And so again, as I said, if the ethos of Silicon Valley is avoid regulation at all costs, why is this successful fintech entrepreneur doing what Live Oak did and leaning into the regulation. He talks about just the complexity of the fintech supply chain. If you're a fintech and you want to offer banking services, you're reliant on your banking partner and all of that middleware tech and the legacy core providers ultimately to do that. And so you can't truly innovate. And then there's this extra layer of costs that where it's hard to operate profitably. But the example he gives is... If we think about wiring funds, most customers think of that as pretty clunky technology. You can only do it from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. You have to speak to someone or go into a branch. It's just not ideal. But if you actually look at the Fed wire protocol, it's actually extremely robust. You can send a wire 23 hours a day, six days a week. And so those time limitations are actually imposed by the banks themselves because there's still so many manual processes and they need sign off and they need people to be in the office when they can approve wires. But if you abstract that all away and automate it, wires can become this technology that's actually pretty powerful. But a fintech who wants to offer wires to their customers are reliant on their banking partner and all that legacy tech, where what William Hockey is trying to do at Column, because he has a direct line into the Fed, is create low-level infrastructure that other banks can tap into to do some of this in a much more efficient manner. And so that's the vision that Live Oak saw as well, and the benefits of being a fully chartered national bank as opposed to a neobank or a fintech. It's a great anecdote on the wiring system and what the actual bottleneck is. When you look at Live Oak and the different pieces, you reference at the very beginning SBA program and lending that occurs there, walked us through the unit economics. Then you have this other piece, which is incubating, investing, creating this technology. When you put them together, what percentage of the business can be attributed to which? How do you think about that, whether it's earnings profile, book value, any other way that you would account for it? How important is the tech side of things and how important is the traditional lending business? Historically, the tech piece was a great way for them to scale and build capital in a capital-efficient, non-dilutive way. It started with Encino, which actually didn't add capital to the bank. They just spun that out. And so all of those gains that initial shareholders were rewarded with aren't included in historical financials. It's excluded. But if you look at Aperture, I think this is a great example. So after Encino was spun out, Neil Underwood and his team, they walk over to the other side of the balance sheet. They start writing code to improve the online banking experience. So remote deposit capture, bill pay, and other online banking services that you would use. And so He's doing this internally. He hires 40 plus engineers and they're now a publicly traded company, a 10 million plus 
expense bucket is a big drag on earnings and valuation. It's probably something north of $100 million of equity value that this is weighing the company down by. This is another example where they're turning an expense bucket into a revenue driver. They come up with this unique JV where they partner with First Data and they take First Data's legacy online banking solution, which originated with the Funds Express acquisition in 2007. But that business had a few hundred banking customers, something like 60 million of revenue, maybe 18 million of free cash flow. And they slap it together with these 40 engineers at Live Oak to modernize that solution and put it on AWS, make it an API first so point solution. So you have 10 million of expenses that now go into the JV. And so they're offloaded, but their 50% stake in the JV is valued at $68 million of tier one capital. And so you've turned 100 million plus valuation drag into 68 million of book value, valued at a multiples of book, but also their share of the losses that are flowing through to the income statement weren't 5 million of the 10 million of expenses because you're getting some of this revenue and earnings that the legacy business from First Data is spitting off to absorb a lot of those incremental expenses. So there's one example of how they were able to build capital in an efficient way. And they did the same with Finzac. So they seeded the Sanchez brothers, as I said, to go build a modern core provider. They ultimately invested about $13 million into Finzac. That was sold in 2022 to Fiserv for over $650 million. Live Oak gets a 10x return on their investment, and they put $120 million in their pockets to build capital. And so historically, that is where the technology came into play. I think building capital on the balance sheet. Today, from an earnings perspective, it's not going to impact earnings until they realize some of these exits. Almost all of their core earnings will be from the banking and the lending side of the institution. If you think about book value between Aperture and Live Oak Ventures and their investment in Canopy, it probably represents about 20% of their current book value. And so it is still meaningful and you are exposed to a little bit of volatility there, but the marks seem conservative and their track record has been tremendous in building value on the technology equity side. The example of being able to take that expense and flip it into a much lower expense, potentially an earning stream, in addition to additional capital on the balance sheet that you can use for lending purposes is particularly interesting. So I guess flipping to that traditional banking business itself, when you think about the growth streams, what does that look like from here? And I do want to flash back into the past a little bit, but just from a landscape and opportunity set, how do they think about the opportunity from here in terms of scaling? Is it ultimately to look more like traditional banks do, maybe just without the overhead? Is there anything else that they're doing that's creative in terms of growing that banking business? I'm an investor that hunts power laws. And one of the ways to achieve that is to find companies that can grow above average rates for a very long period of time, decades. And to me, the formula to achieve that is low penetration paired with strengthening competitive advantages. And here you have that in spades. I mean, so from a penetration standpoint, there are something like close to 30 million small businesses in the country. But if you exclude all of the solopreneur businesses, you're still left with probably five or six million businesses that are sub five million of revenue, maybe two to 500 employees. The big banks aren't necessarily focused on this market. And Live Oak has sub 10,000 lending customers. And so there's a massive penetration opportunity within small businesses and to become America's small business bank. And then we talked about the competitive advantages, whether it's no branches, whether it's technology, whether it's their theory of verticality. And so, so much of success is choosing the right game to play and choosing who you're competing against. And I think community banks in general would be a competitive set that I would relish competing against. I think there's a very long runway for growth. What are the specific areas or some of the strategies? Well, number one, it's just more SBA loans. So they're the leading SBA lender and they only have something like 7% share. And so they're going to continue to make more SBA loans in the 35 industries that they currently serve. And then also continue to expand into other industries. I think the SBA allows you to lend to something like 1200 industries. They're in 35. So there's a penetration opportunity to expand there as well. And then 
there's an opportunity to do more conventional loans. So they are deep domain experts within the 35 industries they currently serve. And they have a very high MPS on the lending side. I think it's 67 for borrowers, but only 20% of their borrowers are repeat borrowers. So historically, some of them have tended to graduate to bigger banks, but now Live Oak is offering a full suite of loan options. And so there's an opportunity to retain those customer relationships for longer and do more conventional lending. And then the third piece is just more products. So right now they are really innovating on the liability side of the balance sheet and building out a suite of checking account products and operating accounts to retain more customer deposits. And so right now, only 3% of their customers both have a lending relationship and a deposit relationship. But as of September, they launched their fully featured checking accounts. Every Live Oak loan is being funded into a Live Oak checking account. And so now there's still the challenge of making those active and not having customers just transfer the money out. But I think there's a big opportunity to build the deposit base amongst their customers, increase stickiness, reduce cost of funding to improve net interest margin along the way. And then the ultimate vision is embedded banking. And so embedded banking would be to offer Live Oak banking services within a vertical market software practice management solution that these entrepreneurs are using on a day-to-day -day basis to run their business. So if you think about a veterinarian, like what is the software they're using to manage their appointments and to order drugs from suppliers? Well, whatever that software is, Live Oak should be able to link in with an API and it requires this modern suite that they've built and then offer their banking products right alongside that. So the customer doesn't have to log into a separate platform. And then also you're getting much more data to offer tailored products, whether that's working capital lines, et cetera. But it creates much stickier relationships and just takes the competitive advantage versus your standard community bank to another level. Yeah. I even notice it with our business where certain tools, because they become so easy to use and just even something with corporate cards now versus the old Amex where you had to literally take photocopies of your receipts. Now you could just do simple things like emailing receipts or taking a picture on your phone and sending it to an email address. The friction of the incumbents versus the ease of use of technology makes a major difference for customers. It's an N of one, but I see it myself. I want to flash back to a few of the things that have happened in the banking system recently, just to understand how they've impacted Live Oak, if at all. The first thing is where many people heard about the SBA program, and that was through PPP loans. So what did that look like for Live Oak? Was it a major tailwind through the COVID cycle? And has there been any legacy impact on the business besides that huge bump and massive exposure to the SBA program for all of the US? Has there been any fallout or positive impact that took place after the PPP loan program? Yeah, so Live Oak definitely punched above their weight during PPP. And it makes sense. If you want to be America's small business bank, you sure as hell better be on your game when that legislation came out. So they originated something like $2.3 billion of PPP loans, generated over 80 million of fees and net interest income, primarily in 2020 and 2021, which actually made up about a third of their income during that period. And so it was yet another example where they were able to opportunistically build capital in a non-dilutive way. It was for sure a tailwind to their business. I mean, if you think about other banks, maybe PPP originations were 5 or 10% of their originations during that period. And Live Oak was something like 30%. That has obviously all run off. I think in terms of what it did was allowed them to build their brand and they were something like 11,000 customers took PPP funds from Live Oak. And so they had exposure to 11,000 customers, not all of which had a prior relationship with Live Oak. And so it just enhanced their brand and capital base within the small banking community. But that has all run off at this point. Now, in terms of interest rates, we had this discussion on the First Citizens episode where rising interest rates are one thing, the speed at which rates went up is another thing. And banks being able to adjust their balance sheets and properly balance assets and liabilities around a new rate environment. How have higher rates impacted Live Oak? They've been impacted a little bit, but not nearly as much as other banks have. 
on the one hand, I said net interest margin has been a little bit depressed this year as rates are rising, but that should bounce back. The vast majority of their loans are variable rate in nature. From a duration standpoint, they're protected there. And then from a liquidity standpoint, they have this secret weapon or this treasure chest in terms of the fact that 40% of their loans are government guaranteed portion of loans. And so they can offload some of that to access liquidity whenever they need. And it also boosts their capital position as well compared to most banks. Looking at most banks, not all lending books are created equal. And that 40% government guarantee provides them a lot of flexibility to access liquidity and just put up better credit metrics over time. And then last event, which I think you were alluding to in terms of what might happen, the Silicon Valley Bank march, it feels like so long ago, while it was less than a year ago, how were they impacted with all of the hysteria going on with SVB and the run on that bank? Zero impact aside from just a sell down in the stock during the mania when people weren't sure of what was going on. But their uninsured deposits were much lower than the average bank. I think it was something like 18% of their deposits were uninsured. And they quickly increased liquidity to have three times that coverage amount. They didn't see any impact to deposits through the hysteria. And since then, the stock has bounced back up. And so they managed leading up and through that crisis as well as you can expect. And it may make sense to talk about the deposit side actually for a little bit. And so when they started this and they were doing the originate and sell model, they were funding that with relatively high cost wholesale deposits. I mean, they just weren't focused on the deposit side because the lending side was so profitable. And then in 2014, 15, right around the time of the IPO, they launched a high interest savings account. So I think something that would compete with Goldman Sachs, Marcus, or American Express personal savings. And so here you're really competing on price. Live Oak adds a service layer, which we can really get into that differentiates them, but you still have high cost deposits. And that's how they've funded the balance sheet for nearly the past decade. Now you're getting into that operating account side and attracting checking account customers with much lower cost of funding. And so there's an opportunity for them to bring their cost of funding down over time as non-interest bearing checking accounts increases as a percent of the total. Yeah, it's very interesting, particularly with something like SVB, where it was such a focus for that business to maintain customer funds whenever they did make a loan. It was very much assumed or needed to be insured that if there was capital associated with something that SVB was attached to, a large portion of those dollars would stay within the SVB bank as a deposit. And you get some type of exponential growth from that where you can make loans, but you're also maintaining assets to then make more loans. I'm just curious, with that strategy here and their hope to grow the deposit base over time, how has that looked and trended? And are they seeing success? And how important do you think that is in terms of reaching that next level of success in terms of where they compete? They've scaled to $11 billion of assets and $850 million of equity without that as any component of the business plan. So I don't think it's a necessary ingredient for success. If you want to continue to increase returns on equity, which I still think they could put up 15% next year without this tailwind. But if you want to get into the high teens approaching 20% threshold, then the increase of non-interest bearing checking accounts will improve. And then also it'll just increase customer stickiness over time. If you have that deposit relationship and you're taking a conventional loan, you're just even less likely to graduate to one of the bigger banks. The metrics that you just referenced in terms of mid-teens ROE and potentially even higher are quite impressive. Are there leverage dynamics besides the core business model of what you mentioned in terms of the loan origination and the unique dynamics with SBA and, and being able to sell those loans? Are there other things going on from a leverage perspective that are driving an ROE, which I would consider to be at the high end of the range for banks? There's a few components. I think they're just best in class. As you think about a bank and how they make money, they're best in class in all of the metrics. And we can walk through the unit economics They've actually graduated from the originate and sell model. When they went public, 
as you would expect, investors didn't love that non-recurring aspect of revenue. And there was also some accounting noise with how they were valuing their servicing asset that they retained. And so it just created lumpiness. Investors were penalizing them for that. And so around like 2017, 18 timeframe, they started holding a lot more of the loans they were originating, which is why now 40% of their book is government guaranteed. But in terms of how they're putting up that 15% number or how I'm triangulating around that. So it's an $11 billion bank, think $10 billion of interest earning assets and 850 million of equity. So there's a lot of embedded leverage in there. But on the 10 billion of interest earning assets, I think next year they could get back to a 375 net interest margin. So you have 375 million of net interest income. Slap on another 125 million for non-interest income, things like gains on sale for the loans they are selling, things servicing revenue and the like. And so now you're at 500 million of revenue pre-provision. And so what efficiency ratio can they operate at? I mean, it's bounced around over time, but I think 60% has been where it's bounced around. And I think that's a good stake in the ground. Oh, and by the way, that actually has a lot of engineering talent that should be classified as a growth investment as they're building out this next-gen technology architecture. But let's just say 60%. So you have 200 million of pre-provision income, let's say provisions through cycle or something like 40 basis points given their theory of verticality, which has worked out amazingly well from a credit perspective. And then also that 40% government guaranteed portion. So you're left with 160 million of pre-tax profits, something like 130 million post-tax. So on the 850 of equity, that's how you get to the ROE. There's upside on the 375 net interest margin as their cost of funding starts to decline. And then there's also upside on the efficiency ratio as they continue to scale. This is a branchless model. They should be operating below that. It was a really helpful overview in terms of how they can achieve those numbers and just the moving pieces to it. In terms of competition here, what do you think the competitive threats are, whether it's just directly competing in terms of the same type of strategy that Live Oak has executed on, or as they are bigger, there's this idea of graduating, which they have. But as you graduate, you start to compete with some of the bigger players. So how do you think about competitive threats? I think for this sector, banking in general is a sector that I would love to compete in. But let's go back to neobanks and fintechs. So let's say Column, which is William Hockey's company, is successful and you eliminate all of that regulatory barrier to entry and fintechs can operate on a level playing field. To me, Live Oak is still going to win. There are two aspects to this. One, Silicon Valley-backed startups are not well-suited to lend money. It's an industry that doesn't suit itself to moving fast and breaking things. So if I think about this, you're selling money. And it's something that has universal products market fit. And it ultimately comes down to pricing. I'm this introvert who likes to sit at home and read and listen to podcasts. And yet, if you incentivize me to go out and sell dollars for dimes, I could build you a billion-dollar book of business very quickly. And I think, historically, that's what fintechs have done. They're just not good at underwriting loans. They're trying to grow at all costs. Or they're trying to grow at a much faster pace than banks should grow at. And we actually saw this with PPP. And so as you think about SBA lending and the competitive environment there, because the regulation actually has loosened a bit where now neobanks can originate SBA loans. But within PPP, like so you saw Cabbage and some others really trying to move fast and just generate fees by originating as much as they could. Well, there was rampant fraud on their platform. They didn't have the appropriate procedures in place to catch some of the stuff that should have been obvious. And yet Live Oak, as a subscale bank, is originating over $2 billion and there's no issues. I mean, so just one from like a culture and an underwriting standard perspective, safety and soundness has to be first. And culture is the other piece of it. It actually, I loved the Munger interview with John Collison that you guys ran on Invest Like the Best. One of my favorite aspects of that when he was talking about net jets. Oh, the differentiator is culture. It's like, okay, safety first, customer service second, and then we'll worry about the capitalists that own the company. And Live Oak is run the exact same way. And so I want to talk about actually culture and how it differentiates. I mean, if you think about most neobanks or most branchless banks, customer service is lacking. If you think about a high interest savings account, you don't generally have a great experience, but you're earning more money on your capital. 
Live Oak takes a very high touch approach. So every borrower, they actually will fly to and meet face to face, belly to belly, and like look at them, go over the business plan, see if they have the eye of the tiger and a plan for success. And then on the deposit side, they have this well-trained and well-staffed call center. And so a few months ago, I actually I was expecting a wire into my Live Oak account. And I was traveling that day and the wire hadn't hit, even though the sender said it had sent. And so now I'm going through all of the anxiety and early afternoon, I call Live Oak. Within 10 seconds, I get a gentleman named Ryan on the phone. And so I explained to Ryan what happened. And he said, that's interesting. How much was the wire for? And I told him, I said, who was the sending institution? Hang tight. I'll be back in a few minutes. So then two minutes later, he gets on the line and he says, look, I just worked with my wire staff to go through every single transaction that hit the bank today and nothing was for that amount. Like, do you mind reaching back out to the sender and just making sure that it went through? So I do that. And of course, it turns out that the sending institution, even though they said it was confirmed, they flagged it at the last minute because that account had never sent money to this account. And so then all is resolved. But then a few hours later, right before five o'clock, I get a call back from Ryan. And he said, hey, Mr. Vafier, I know you're traveling today. I didn't want this to hang over your head overnight. And so I just wanted to give you an update that the funds have hit your account. They're readily available. And is there anything else I can help you with today? And I said, no. But that is an amazing customer experience. By the way, there's no incoming wire fees on Live Oak. They're paying me 4.4% for the privilege of that customer service. And it creates this emotional attachment and this word of mouth experience with their customers. I'll share one more quick story on the lending side. I mean, so here in Wilmington, North Carolina, we have this homegrown celebrity named Bevan Prince. Bevan was at film school at UNC Wilmington while One Tree Hill was being filmed here. And so then she becomes an extra on set and then she becomes a regular extra standing in on most filming days. And then one day they write a, a line for Bevan. And then before you realize it, she becomes a star of the show playing a character under her own name, Bevan. So then after One Tree Hill wraps, I mean, she moves to New York City to continue to pursue acting. In between auditions, she starts teaching at SoulCycle. And here she really finds her passion and she grows up with the company as SoulCycle is experiencing explosive growth. She's one of their best instructors. The pandemic hits. So her and her husband need to escape New York City. They go to Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina, which is one of our premier beaches here in Wilmington. And like me and like so many others, they just fall in love with the lifestyle. And so now she has the entrepreneurial itch. She wants to start her own cycling studio called Recess with Bevan. It's the middle of the pandemic. And so her business plan is, let me get some space in a parking lot. I'll set up a tent. I'll have a storage unit and I'll roll the bikes out each morning and I'll set up an outdoor cycling studio. No lender would originate this loan. And Live Oak did, partially because maybe she's based in Wilmington, partially because they specialize in that sector of fitness facilities. It goes back to this eye of the tiger. They saw something in Bevan that she would just not quit. And we've seen that manifest. So a few months after she starts recess by Bevan, her tent gets blown away by a hurricane. She rebuilds, continues on. And then there was just a tragedy a couple of years ago where her husband was on a boat on 4th of July and gets struck by lightning and dies. Most entrepreneurs would close up shop and yet now... Her ambition is bigger than ever. She's playing a bigger game and she wants to expand into more cities, more studios and continue to build the vision she had. So you hear her talk about her origin story and Live Oak becomes this emotional experience. The way they made the lending experience seamless and the way they helped her build out the facility and the business plan. And so it's pretty special. And that word of mouth virality is more valuable than any paid advertising they can do. Yeah, that's incredible on both sides of it. I mean, a personal anecdote and then something that's third party, but big. And to your point, there's a reason why there's influencer marketing and people pay so much for it is because people can be the strongest driver of growth for businesses if they've had good personal experiences with those businesses. It's the word of mouth. And of course, marketers just tried to tap into that. But I think it's a super, super, super interesting point there. On the culture side of things, it feels like Chip Mahan is very important to this overall organization. He is somebody where after hearing this story, his story, feel like there should be more about him and maybe there is out there on the internet. How important is he in terms of driving this machine and being the visionary behind everything they're doing? How do you think about him as a piece of this and 
what his outlook looks like over the next few years, the next 10 years, whatever it might be. Huge. I mean, he has been the driving force of success here. As you said, they got started in 2007. They officially got their charter, I think, in May of 2008, the last bank to do so before the global financial crisis. So they get their charter, and then the world comes crashing down. It's interesting. The FDIC hated them. I think Sheila Bear actually named them the doggy bank because they're lending to veterinarians. So they're based in Wilmington, North Carolina, with no branches, lending to one industry with one product. So actually, when the world was falling apart, the FDIC called Chip Mahan and Neil Underwood into their offices, and they said, look, I want you to liquidate or sell this bank. This is less than a year after they got their charter. And he looked them dead in the eye and he said, no, ma'am, I can't do it. I have 40 million of loans to female veterinarians. I need to take care of my customers. You need to do what you need to do. And ultimately, they backed down. They were on the brink of existence. And there's an example where it takes a special founder to operate through that. And so, yes, he has been the driving force. Neil Underwood, who we've talked about, he was the architect of the technology strategy. But succession is definitely a risk here. I mean, Chip is 72 and he's still going strong. I mean, I hope he has another 10 or 20 years left in him. A few years ago, I would have said, Neil Underwood, he's president of the bank holding company. He would be the perfect successor here. He's been at the bank since 2011. He is a large equity owner. He definitely will have the requisite founder mentality to make hard decisions and continue to invest for the long term. Well, recently, Neil has stepped back from his operating role. He's still on the board, but now he's focused on Canopy, which is the fintech venture investing arm. And so I think the most obvious successor would be the new president who has been CFO of Live Oak since 2021, but he was promoted to president recently, BJ Loesch. And so BJ comes from First Horizon. He seems very capable. And I think where he really gets it is the financial acumen of how do you put up 15% plus returns on equity within a bank holding company mixed with that culture of customer service and treating every customer like the only customer in the bank. However, he's only been with the bank for two years. Will he have that organizational goodwill to really make hard decisions if and when Chip is no longer here. So that's definitely an open question. Very interesting. Are there any other risks that exist? I think we've talked through the various risks. There's obvious risks to banks, but anything else we haven't discussed that you would think about? So most banking analysts, they think about credit, liquidity, and duration. And I think We've talked about that. I mean, credit history through the theory of verticality has been exceptional. Something like 30 basis points of charge-offs for the past decade compared with most SBA loans, which is something like 10 times that. Liquidity, they can tap into their 40% of government guaranteed loans. And then duration, most of their loans are variable rate in nature. I think succession is one risk I would focus on. We talked about how 20% of book value is tied up in Aperture, Live Oak Ventures, and Canopy. So that would be another. You have potential volatility there. And then the third would be their reliance on FinZact. So FinZact is their next-gen modern core provider. And it got acquired, as I said, by Fiserv about 18 months ago. Whenever you have this disruptive technology company swallowed up by an incumbent, you have some risk where innovation just stalls and fades out into the sunset. And this is the partner that Live Oak is relying on to build out embedded banking and a lot of their technology vision. So far, the integration looks to be going well. Everything I've heard, it seems to be going well, but that would be another risk that I would focus on and uh, continue to follow. And from a valuation perspective, I know you're not a traditional banking analyst. We've heard different frameworks, something along the lines of, you think about book value and something can earn an ROE of 15%, 1.5 times book, and you slide it a 10% ROE, maybe one times book. How do you think about just the valuation of this business? If there's any framework or methodology that you use, just generally how investors perceive it, because it does sound like it's slightly different than what you see with most banks and that 20% piece of the asset portfolio looks a little bit different. It's traded up over the past few weeks. It's trading just under two times book value today. And so if they earn that 15% return on equity next year, something like a, a 13 times earnings multiple, plus you're not giving any credit for their 
tech investments. And so over time, maybe that adds another few hundred basis points of tailwind and you get a through cycle ROE in the high teens because of that. So I think the multiple is reasonable. Maybe there's some upside, maybe not. But to me, it doesn't really matter. I mean, I think if this is going to be earning 15% year in, year out, and then able to organically grow the business at the same rate in a non-dilutive way, I think investors will compound at that rate of growth. I think if they execute, investors will compound in that 15 to 20% range for a very long period of time. It's a little bit cleaner to think about that framework when it comes to a bank, just because of the dynamics of how that business works. As we start to wind down the conversation, one of the things that we always close out with is the lessons that you can take from looking at this business and try to apply it elsewhere from an investment perspective. Do you think there's any major lessons that stand out here as it relates to Live Oak or whether it's Chip or anything else as part of the story that you think are major lessons? Yeah, I think there's a few. So number one, the whole through line of this conversation has been the importance of founder mentality and how Chip Mahan has been the driving force. So Sam Hinkie on Invest Like the Best, he said that people are power laws and the best ones change everything. Well, Chip Mahan is the quintessential example of that or one of the best examples of that. And so to me, this is a reminder that as a long-term concentrated investor, I can run away from the casuals and run away from the folks with minimal skin in the game or the people that are playing the quarterly earnings charade. And instead, I want to search for people who are like Chip, who are disrupting industries by doing things that are different and different by design. And he is just passionate and persuasive. He's a storyteller and a sloganeer. And I think that so much of investing just comes down to people and it's something that can't be measured. So that's one. And then two, I think it's the old trope that there are riches and niches. Live Oak leveraged the SBA 7A program to scale in a profitable and efficient manner. And it's that 75% government guarantee that allowed them to really self-fund growth. And so this was an afterthought for most banks, as we talked about. And yet Live Oak, through an innovative business plan, was able to become the at-scale lender in subscale markets. And it's a reminder to me that small things can become really big over time. The third one that I would say is to search for end companies. You don't have to settle. So Live Oak is profitable and growing at healthy organic rates. Chip Mahan is an incredible operator within banking, and he's a phenomenal capital allocator. And then Live Oak offers the best business savings rate out there at 4%, and they're offering the best customer service. Again, as a concentrated investor, I'm looking for those companies that do it all. Focusing again on number two, it really is a fascinating case study in terms of taking something that's very niche and using that as the angle to break into this huge industry with a lot of legacy players, the whole mindset of too big to fail. There's a too big categorization there in terms of the bigger banks, but they've pulled this off over the past 15 years in such an interesting way. So we really appreciate you coming on and breaking this name down. Thanks for letting me share the Live Oak story. To find more episodes of Breakdowns ranging from Costco to Visa to Moderna, or to sign up for our weekly summary, check out joincolossus.com. That's J-O-I-N-C-O-L-O-S-S-U-S dot com. 